18 as well. We've just sung, our Father, that we are willing to lift our souls to you, to bow our wills before you. And we pray that that would be true, not just as we sing, but as we listen to your word. And then as we go into the next week, we ask for the power of your spirit to work within us, opening our eyes and our hearts to understand and receive your word, our minds, and then bending our wills so that we might worship you in a way that is pleasing to you today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me read to us then from Judges 18. I'm going to start halfway through the chapter at verse 16. Now, the 600 men of the Danites, armed with their weapons of war, stood by the entrance of the gate. And the five men who had gone to scout out the land went up and entered and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, while the priests stood by the entrance of the gate with the 600 men armed with weapons of war. And when these went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, the priest said to them, what are you doing? And they said to him, keep quiet, put your hand on your mouth and come with us and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for you to be the priest to the house of one man or to be a priest to a tribe and clan in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household gods and the carved image and went along with the people. So they turned and departed, putting the little ones and the livestock and the goods in front of them. When they'd gone a distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house were called out and they overtook the people of Dan and they shouted to the people of Dan who turned round and said to Micah, what is the matter with you that you come with such a company? And he said, you take my gods that I made and the priest and go away. And what have I left? How then do you ask me, what is the matter with you? And the people of Dan said to him, don't let your voice be heard among us lest angry fellows fall upon you and you use, lose your life with the lives of your household. Then the people of Dan went their way. And when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his home. But the people of Dan took what Micah had made and the priest who belonged to him. And they came to Laish, to a people quiet and unsuspecting, and struck them with the edge of the sword and burned the city with fire. And there was no deliverer because it was far from Sidon and they had no dealings with anyone. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehob. Then they built the city and lived in it, and they named the city Dan after the name of Dan, their ancestor, who was born to Israel. But the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the people of Dan set up the carved image for themselves. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up Micah's carved image that he made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. It'd be great if you could keep that open in front of you. There's also an outline is ever on the back of the notice sheet that might be useful to you. Um, I need to say right up front that um, the two sermons we're going to have this Sunday morning and next Sunday morning are, I think, two of the most depressing sermons that you will ever hear. Um, I realize that's not the, the greatest form of advertising to whet your appetite and get you to come back next week. I think it is realistic, though. Um, we've said in this series, if you've been with us, that the book of Judges explains how God's people went from the good days of Joshua, when the whole of God's people were promising to worship and serve God wholeheartedly, to dark days when everyone ignored God and did what was right in their own eyes. And we've traced through the book this downward spiral as the people and even the, the judges have drifted further and further from God's will. And it's in these last five chapters that things finally hit rock bottom. And we see how bad things get when God's people reject God's rule. Um, some of you have said that you've never heard a series, a sermon series on judges before. 
I suspect that these five chapters are a large part of the reason why. Uh, to set the context, the structure of Judges is pretty simple. If you've not been here, there's a brief introduction. The main body of the book runs from chapter 3, verse 7 to the end of chapter 16. That, that's where we get the stories of the judges after whom the book is named. And now these last five chapters are the, the epilogue or the conclusion. And they're shoved at the end of the book, but actually the events that they described happened much earlier, back in the time of chapters 1 and 2. But our author groups them together to try and press home his main message about the moral and the spiritual decline of God's people. As we read them, they're chapters that are meant to make us grieve as we see how bad things had become in Israel. But they're also here to instruct us and to warn us along with all of God's people so that we don't end up copying the mistakes that plagued God's people in those days. And wherever we look in the chapters, we find evidence of what we can call a, a pandemic of godlessness in the land. Um, our chapters today, 17 and 18, record religious failure. And then next week, chapters 19 to 21, horrific moral failure. Let me just say a, a word. If you're um, a family who keep your kids in or get them to listen through to the sermons, you might want to read through the chapters in advance of next Sunday so that you can think about how you can talk to them about it before they come. Some of the material is horrific. But the thing that is even more depressing is that at this stage, uh, two things really. One, that there aren't any judges around who can provide even temporary relief in the midst of all of this moral and spiritual carnage. And then two, it's depressing that it all feels very, very contemporary. We'll see that today. We'll see it even more strikingly next week. We read about Israel's ancient wickedness, but it feels like looking in a mirror at life in 21st century Britain, certainly, and sadly, even in parts of the, the visible church. Our subject today is religious, it is idolatry. Um, broadly speaking, just so we can define our terms, God forbids two kinds of idolatry in the Bible. Uh, the first is when you, you worship the wrong God. Uh, that could be a, a religious thing explicitly, like when the people of Israel worship the Baals or the Ashtoreth, or when people worship a, a, a non-true God today. That's uh, worshipping the wrong God. It's also wrong, though, to worship the right God in the wrong way. There's good evidence for thinking that when Aaron made the golden calf in Exodus, the people didn't think that they were worshipping a lump of metal, but that they were using the lump of metal as a way of worshipping the one true God who had just saved them from uh, Egypt. But in defining the terms upon which they were relating to God, in choosing their own way of worshipping the true God, it was still in breach of the second commandment. It was still idolatry. So you can worship the wrong God, or you can worship the right God in the wrong way. And that's where we are this morning, that second time, as we see Israel disintegrating spiritually before our eyes. Two chapters because they're a unit and uh, the disease spreads in three phases. The first little bit, um, verses one to six of chapter 17, we, we see a picture of um, false worship in a single family. Chapter seven to 13, it, it spreads uh, and we see it infecting the priestly tribe of Levi through this one man. And then by chapter 18, a whole, a whole tribe has become infected. And the spread is for us a picture of what it looks like whenever a, a generation of God's people or a denomination or even an, an individual maybe rejects the true worship of God. It's kind of a character study of what happens when you don't worship God in the way that he wants us to. We'll focus on chapter 17 and we've got three main points. The first is the heart of God abandoning religion the heart of it. Verse 6 is a familiar summary for us by now. I think in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right 
in his own eyes. And you'll be used to me saying it wasn't that they didn't have a king. God was their king. But when you ignore God, then they started doing what was right in their own eyes. And straight away, there's a surprise, I think. Would you not expect, this is what I was reflecting on, that when a, a nation turns away from God, it's going to spell the end of their religious life. Interestingly here, uh, the opposite happens. There's no shortage of religion and spirituality going on in Israel in those days because the rejection of God doesn't always lead to atheism. Sometimes it leads to idolatry. Uh, G.K. Chesterton uh, famously said, when people stop worshipping God, it's not that they worship nothing, it's that they start worshipping anything. And as Israel abandoned the true worship of God, it didn't lead to an absence of worship, but to an abundance of false worship. So we would be wrong to think that if you lived in a, a land where national denominations were abandoning Christ and rejecting his word, that it would necessarily mean that all of their churches get sold off and turned into apartments or carpet shops or something. Because the opposite can happen. There are people in every generation who like to participate in godless idolatry. So let's look more closely at Micah and what one writer called his image problem. Verse one, there was a man of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Micah. He said to his mother, the 1100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse and also spoke it in my ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the 1100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I'll restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver, gave them to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image. And it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine and he made an ephod and household gods and ordained one of his sons who became a priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. At first sight, you, you could scrape around and try and find some positives. Micah's name means who is like the Lord. Normally, that kind of name suggests that this is a, a house of true devotion to the Lord. And that impression grows when Micah's mum prays for God's blessing to be on him. She dedicates this returned silver to the Lord. Verse 10 tells us that 10 pieces of silver was a year's wages. So 1,100 pieces, that's a, a pretty extravagant gesture. And there's no suggestion that she was being insincere. But we would know, I hope, that sincerity is no guarantee of faithfulness. Uh, one writer summarizes it like this. This family are both deadly sincere and thoroughly pagan. So Micah himself has disregarded both the fifth and the eighth commandments. He uh, stole from his mum uh, all the, the silver in the first place. And the only reason he gave it back was that he'd heard her utter a curse on the thief. There's no repentance. There's just like fear and self-interest. Even worse, though, is what Micah's mum decides to do with the money when he returns it. I, he's, she's dedicating it to the Lord to make a carved image and a metal image, the very thing that God had forbidden. So the way that she's expressing her dedication to Yahweh is to disregard the second commandment when God said, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Step back with me for a second. Just think about why God is so opposed to the making of images of him. It's worth us doing that. It's because by definition, any kind of image can only reveal or portray one tiny aspect of God's nature and character. So Aaron made that golden calf in Exodus, and to some it may have helped to symbolize God's strength, but it communicated nothing of his righteousness and love. Or imagine you decide to paint a picture of God. Do you show him smiling and loving or awe-inspiring and majestic? There's no, no way that a lifeless image 
can capture the full glory of God. And therefore, any image necessarily dis displays a distorted impression of what God is like. And if you then use that image as the way that you worship God, you're actually failing at that point to relate to God as he truly is. You're just picking the bits of him that you want to focus on and worshiping them rather than worshiping him in spirit and in truth. And that's what Micah's uh, family, Micah and his mom, are doing here. And the problem isn't confined to the image either. God had said, worship me in the place of my choosing. That's why Micah built his own shrine. God had said, the sons of Levi will be my priests. That's why Micah ignores that and ordains his own son as a priest. So in all those different ways... He was refusing to allow God to define the terms of their relationship. And that is the heart of God abandoning idolatry. It refuses to let God be God in my dealings with him. But what I want us to think about is whether we see the same thing happening in the visible church today. Uh, one commentator says he thinks this is the main sin of our time. And that would happen whenever we filter out the bits of God that we don't like or that our hearts find hard to accept. You can do it with God's character. If someone says, I like to think of God as, or I couldn't believe or in or accept a God who, and then finishes the sentence. What you're doing at that moment is putting your, our own values above what God has revealed about himself. Slightly less, obviously, maybe if we decide we like God being loving, but we're less keen on his justice, you can end up playing those attributes off against each other. You emphasize one at the expense of the other, or the other way around, and you're doing much the same thing. It can happen not just with God's character, but with his command. Someone said to me, I, we can no longer accept a God who forbids and then named a part of God's clearly revealed will that they find unacceptable. But if we decide that we have the right deliberately to ignore what God has said about money, about sexuality about ambition or whatever it is we're no longer worshiping god on his terms we're doing a mica we're worshiping an image of our own devising for us not usually a physical image with something that's carved that you put on a mantelpiece but often for us just a mental distortion of god's true nature and one of the saddest things about this sort of idolatry is that it is self-defeating in the sense that it makes true relationship with God impossible. Uh, I sometimes illustrate it trivially by saying, imagine your name is Samantha and you're someone who likes to hug people. But then there's this bloke who insists on calling you Dave and uh, poking you in the ribs the whole time. And if whatever you say to them, they still refuse to call you Samantha and give you hugs, but just call you Dave and poke you, the friendship is not going to last, is it? Well, the same is true with God. If we were to try to redefine who he is, if we were to try to redraw the terms of our relationship with him, we might end up with a religion that we find comfortable and acceptable. But ultimately, we would be worshipping a God who doesn't exist. True faith doesn't try and change God to fit my heart's priorities. True faith allows God to change my heart to fit his. There's one other element before we move on. I wonder if any of our budding accountants spotted the flaw in the figures between verses 3 and 4. Uh, verse 3, Micah's mum freely dedicates 1,100 pieces of silver uh, to the Lord. By verse 4, quicker than you can say offshore account, God gets 200 pieces and the other 900 are kept for herself. Again, I reckon that's just a little thing that's typical of God abandoning religion. So with our words, we claim to be worshipping God wholeheartedly. But really, we're hedging our bets. 
and holding back from him. Easy, isn't it, to slip into the trap of singing profound songs of worship to God on a Sunday, knowing full well that we've got no intention of seeking his glory on Monday. To say that we want to obey him, when we mean in the little bits of life that suit us, but we want to keep some areas back for ourselves. And of course, we all make that mistake from time to time. We, we should feel the pinch of this in our hearts. But with Micah's mum, it is very deliberate. It's not the stumble of a disciple who is battling to worship God truly, but fails. This is the hypocrisy of someone who worships God with their lips. But that's all it is. It's lip service. And the heart is far away. We should they reflect if there's an area of my life, your life, in which we were doing something like that at the moment, a relationship maybe, a habit that we refuse to give up, a grudge of which we won't let go, an ambition that we won't surrender. We should be seeing that sincere religious endeavor is not enough. It's not the same as true worship. That's our first point, the heart of idolatry. Move on to the second and third more briefly as we think about the motivation. Comes out most clearly in Micah's encounter with the Levite. Uh, the Levites are meant to be the good guys in the Old Testament. Um, I guess we'll know that. They were descended from Aaron. They were set aside as priests to serve God in his tabernacle. They were there to provide a a spiritual lead to Israel as they taught God's word, as they prayed for the people, offered sacrifices on their behalf. Historically, when um, Aaron built his golden calf in Exodus, it was his fellow Levites who stood against his idolatry. Here in verse 8, we've got a different kind of Levite. Um, he's unnamed, but he's freewheeling. He seems to be just backpacking around Ephraim on his gap year. When he bumps into Micah, uh, they get chatting, and soon Micah's offered him a job as his private chaplain. And uh, verse 13 is where you get Micah's motivation. Micah says, now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as my priest. So apparently he's now become worried that having his son isn't going to get the job done. So now he's got a Levite, and God is bound to bless him. But it is, once again, pure superstition. Uh, it's not wrong with wanting to experience God's blessing, of course, but you don't get it by hiring a Levite as a lucky charm and asking him to bless your false worship. Here then there is another feature of godless religion. Micah thinks he can claim God's favor while ignoring God's will. That's it in a nutshell. It reduces God to someone that we can control rather than exalting him as one who is in control. It presumes that his blessing can be earned or manufactured rather than received as a gift. It is sometimes called nominal religion. If you go through the motions of attending church and taking communion regularly enough, then surely that's going to secure God's favor. Or if I pray, when I pray, if I use the right words, or if I have the the right level of emotional intensity, or if I just pray for long enough, then God will have to give me what I want. Or if I just, if I belong to the right denomination or the right church, then God's blessing will be guaranteed on me. It's all back to front though, isn't it? It would still be trying to control God and bend him to my will rather than surrendering myself to him. And of course, if God could be manipulated that easily, he wouldn't be worthy of worship. So we are learning what it looks like when God is abandoned, when the visible people of God do religion in the way that is right in their own eyes. We've thought about the heart. We've thought about the motivation. Finally, the Levite typifies the, the full horror of God abandoning religion. Um, let me make it a multiple choice question because I'm aware that this is quite sobering material. A Levite is meant to be a man of God and provide spiritual leadership in Israel. This is going to be the easiest, easiest exam any of you take in the next uh, 
few weeks, by the way. What do you think a Levite should do, therefore, when he comes across a family who is mired in idolatry? A, do you think that the Levite should warn them gently and teach them a better way? Or B, do you think that he should accept a job from the man and join in his idolatry? I'm hoping 100% all round. Someone said uh, B, I think you were wrong. Uh, for any priest to behave like this would be tragic. Do you know it's doubly tragic? But if you go on to verse 30 of chapter 18, this particular Levite is Moses' grandson, Jonathan. He is driven by self-promotion. He's already walked away from the center of God's work. He's now finds the prospect of being a spiritual advisor and mentor to a rich man so intoxicating that he is willing to abandon his calling and accept a job from the highest bidder. He's meant the covenant of Levi. If you're studying Malachi, you'll remember this. He's meant to stand in awe of the name of the Lord. He's meant to proclaim God's truth and to turn people away from iniquity. And instead, he condones and joins in with it. And then it gets worse. Um, first, in verse 6 of chapter 18, we find him speaking peace when there is no peace, telling the Danite spies whatever they want to hear. Later in verse 19, self-advancement kicks in again. The Danites say, isn't it better for you to serve a whole tribe rather than just one man? He doesn't even hesitate. His heart is so mercenary that we're told his heart is glad. Because who cares if you're abandoning the word of God and reducing his calling to a source of profit and celebrity? He's leading a bigger church now, and that's all that matters. We can only imagine what Moses would have said. Not only has his grandson gone off the rails, but he's corrupted Israel's priesthood in the process. And again, this is what happens when God is abandoned. You would hope to see the religious professionals in a land speaking truth to power and preaching repentance to those who are wayward and fighting hammer and claw to reestablish the word of God among the people. But very often you find them in the pocket of the power brokers. And rather than resisting the rejection of God's word, they stand there and, and bless it and change the message of God to fit the latest whims of their godless society. Take a step back with me then and draw some threads together by my reckoning. And if you've um, dozed off, if you were up at five o'clock this morning to swim in the sea, now is the time to reawake. Here are five clear markers, I think, we've seen of God abandoning religion. God is redefined to fit what our hearts find palatable. God's will is rejected because obedience is too costly. God is worshipped in form, but not from the heart. God's blessing is presumed upon, and God's ministers abandon his truth for the sake of worldly popularity. And as I said earlier, to me, it feels very contemporary. But I want to encourage you to spend some time thinking about whether and to what extent those markers are present in our own church, in our own hearts, and in the wider visible church in our land. These chapters should leave us grieving, but they also instruct us. They stand as a warning to us to guard us from copying the mistakes of old. As we close, uh, I want us to notice the, the bankruptcy of idolatry. Micah starts the passage as a thief. He ends as a victim of theft. And his own words in verse 24 are the best summary. When he says, you take my gods that I made and the priest and go away. And what have I left? He sounds so forlorn that you could almost feel sorry for him. But think of what he's done. He's put in his trust, not in almighty God, but in some lumps of metal that are powerless to defend him. 
and not in God's way of doing religion, but in the mercenary Jonathan as his priest. And now his idols have been stolen and his priest has betrayed him. And this is the disaster that has followed. What have I left? And God wants us to be clear that all idolatry, all God abandoning religion will never pay in the end. And the person who makes success their God fails eventually. The person who makes family their God finds that their kids leave home and don't stay in touch as much as they'd like. If you make your image your God, you'll find that time and aging will defeat you. There'll always be, always be someone cooler that turns up in the end. If we insist on rejecting the God of Bible, the God of the Bible, and we worship a God of our own imagining, we may well end up with a, a glittering academic and ecclesiastical career. But we will stand before him one day, God as he really is. And he will say to us, away from me, I never knew you. And on the last day, if not before, every idolater will cry, what have I left? And the answer will be nothing. There is though a glorious alternative. We can put our trust not in a little carved image of metal, but in the one who is the true image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one in whom there is forgiveness, even for idolaters, the one in whom there is ultimate security, a treasure that can never be taken away, even by death itself, one in whom there is eternal satisfaction. The psalmist says, Lord, whom have I in heaven but you? Earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And what Judges is meant to do is to renew our trust and confidence, to reawaken our sense of need for the ultimate savior of God's people, the Lord Jesus Christ. To recognize that there is idolatry in my heart as there will be in yours. To bring that idolatry to him and to claim the perfect cleansing and forgiveness that he gives and the treasure that can never be taken away. John the Apostle writes, dear children, let us flee from idols. Let's pray together. Well, our Father, it is a, a sad, painfully sad picture of a people who had been saved, but who have forgotten their God and are doing what is right in their own eyes. It's especially sad to think that they thought that they were worshipping you at the same time, but their hearts were so far from you. And so as we grieve at the idolatry of those days, help us please to see it in our day, uh, in the world around us, in the wider church. So much that goes on is so grievous to you. But help us first of all to see it in our own church, in our own hearts, we pray. Help us, please, not to uh, worship you in the way that we want to, but to worship you in the way that you have told us to, in spirit and in truth. Guard our hearts from idols, we pray. Would your spirit work in us to show us ways in which we are stepping aside and draw us back to your son, we ask, in his precious name. Amen.